is blood really thicker than water? What would you do if your family member was to be a serial killer? Would you report them? Would you help them? Would you threaten that you are going to report them? Today we are going full on immersing yourselves into a family member's life of one of the most infamous serial killers, the Unabomber. What's up everybody? How's your Monday? Maya here. <laughs> like, Why do I sound like I'm on a radio and I'm gonna just play you the sickest tune? If by the sickest tune you have a very twisted mind like myself and you are about to go through an hour of just listening about a serial killer blowing up some people, yeah, then that, that is the sickest tune that's gonna start playing right about now. We're talking about Ted Kaczynski today. Heard about him? Probably. If you haven't yet, because it's released for a couple of years now, please go ahead and after this episode watch the Unabomber on Netflix as well. Honestly, it's kind of like why I still keep Netflix for the shows like that. So yeah, it's one of the best things I have probably seen on there. And it's really well done. I haven't watched it in a couple of years. Maybe, you know, instead of just reading articles upon articles, I should have just watched that and just retold you the story of Unabomber. But then I'm here for the real facts, okay? Not a dramatized version. I'm going to dive straight in. But I just want to say something first. This guy scares me and scares me for different reasons that usually people I cover on this podcast do. So I was debating really hard, like, should I do the Zodiac and then, you know, do something else for that mini-sode for the grand finale of, like, the serial killers for October, but no. I should face my fears. And why it scares me is because it's the serial killer I relate most to in terms of his lifestyle, not in terms of his crimes, most definitely not. Don't, like, send police here and be like, hey, Maya has bombs and lives in a cottage, okay? Don't do that. Just in terms of how Ted loved to isolate himself and how comfortable he was with that. That's something I ponder on about quite a lot right now. You know, kind of like six, seven, eight months, however long this quarantine has been. I'm just like, hey, maybe I shouldn't be this well without people. Like, how would you socialize again? Also, you know, maybe I should put like a shirt on every now and then just to feel like how a shirt feels against my skin. So yeah, that's the inside of my brain and why this story scares me. Another reason, and I think that's why I structured it, this episode is going to be structured a bit differently than usual. Where I'll kind of have motive towards the end and I won't have like my usual blabber about your next Zoom call in the end. Just to give you like a full immersive experience into a family member and like what their process must have been. To actually realize that their brother is a serial killer that the whole nation is looking for. How he needs to give up on him. So this is a long one. Let's do it. For 17 years, between 1978 and 1995, the Unabomber terrorized people all over the US with homemade bombs that killed 3 people and injured 23 more. His family will prove that the blood isn't thicker than water and will finally bring this serial killer to justice. What were his motives? In today's discovery, as I mentioned, you're stepping into the shoes of Ted Kaczynski's brother, David. So just imagine, yeah? Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, your name is David. Thanks. <laughs> Thrilled to meet you. And Cantada, and Cantada. Let's go. You're just there chatting with your wife, Linda, and you're like, yo, Linda, what's up? And Linda has been doing some digging. She has been doing some arduous reading online. She has spent some time reading the 35,000 word manifesto written by the Unabomber that was available to the public. So she was just reading through these newspapers and be like, oh my god, this is such arduous reading. But David, look at this. This kind of looks like stuff that your brother would say. She's just there like pointing, be like, who the hell says stuff like cool-headed logicians? That's such a lingo that Ted would use. And then you, David, yeah, you become hella paranoid. So you're like, no, no way. I'm gonna go to the family home. I'm gonna search like all of these trunks and cradles and I'm looking for a word. I think the word is trunk. 
or just old family letters, the papers that he used to write for uni, other things that, yeah, Ted was outspoken, so he did send, uh, like, other letters to the newspapers, just protesting about the abuses of technology. Let me just check those up, because I don't believe it, come on, this is like a long-ass piece, it's by a Unabomber, I don't believe it. And then you, David, come upon a phrase that you know for sure. No one else flips around and flips about this way but your brother Ted. And the phrase is, you can't eat your cake and have it too. Because yes, the correct phrase is you can't have your cake and eat it too. But your brother Ted fucked this thing up the way that I changed the expression to by all means necessary. Yet another day of original thinkers and you David, now you know. You know for sure. And you feel trapped, because you know that you have a relationship with your brother, you kind of, you have grown up to him, you have looked up to him, you were a younger brother, you looked up to him your whole life. Well, that is, until he decided to isolate in like a cottage in the middle of nowhere and kind of disassociate from the family. But up until that point, he was pretty normal. Studious, a nerd, a genius, yes, but pretty normal. But then you know what the Unabomber has done. You've seen it in the news. And you know, if you don't do anything, another bomb might just go off every second and other people might die. But then again, if you turn him in, he might get executed and he is your family, he is your brother. But if you don't, then you need to live with the knowledge that it is your brother and how many more people will be dead, maybe by the end of the day, by tomorrow. At this point, Ted has no idea that his brother and his wife are onto him. He's living his life happily since 1971. So trying to do quick math in my head, that's 24 years, right? (laughs) God, I'm so dumb when it comes to math. It's truly ruining my storytelling skills. And he's feeling pretty proud of himself. I mean, this was 35,000 words. That's like three and a half dissertations. He titled this manifesto Industrial Society and its Future. He argued that technology led human beings away from nature and towards what he calls surrogate activities, like popular entertainment and sports. He asked the human beings desperately to return to the wild nature. And Ted is pondering. He knows he has promised if the newspapers were to publish his manifesto and if the television stations were to broadcast it, he was to stop killing. But then he does have a poem ready to be sent just below his bed. And he has plenty of material left to make some further bombs. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where I'm going to leave you. And now we're going to talk about his bombs spree. And then come back to this plotline where you find out what actually happened to Ted Kaczynski. Bomb sending career, whatever you want to call it, started in 78. And at first, kind of like me with podcasting and just with YouTube, started small. Mm, that was your comparison? Really, Maya, fuck's sake, every time. Sometimes, you know, sometimes trying to make things relatable makes you look a bit like a psycho, just, just a tiny bit. But eventually he would up his game and he would use stuff like smokeless powder, match heads, nails, potassium nitrate, a razor blade, different caustic substances. He would get really knowledgeable. But don't underestimate that, he was already knowledgeable going into this business that nobody made him go to. He graduated from Harvard, he was teaching mathematics himself. Everything seemed to be going so well for him. He was smart, doing well, publishing work, and then it just seems like he just snapped and decided to move to this recluse cottage, which was super small, kind of like people compared it to the size of prison cell. So sure enough, May 25th, 1978 comes around, and Ted decides to send out his first bomb, and he sends it to the Northwestern University in Illinois, and there it injured a campus police officer, Terry Marker. This bomb does leave the officer ending up in a hospital, however, he has recovered. Ted now thinks he can do better, but he is still sticking to the same university, so on May the 9th, 1979, he disguises this next bomb as a cigarette box. And the victim, John Harris, who was a graduate student, receives only minor cuts and burns, luckily. And you're now wondering, okay, this guy is on the spree, there's some mental health issues. 
but it might surprise you to know that he was fully aware that this isn't like normal behavior but he had one single psychiatry session and he realized well a he can't really afford it he's not really working working in this reckless cottage in the middle of nowhere he's kind of just living off plants and just supporting himself maybe by his family sending him some money so he can't afford it but also he can't travel 60 miles to the psychiatrist's office because he would only travel by bike come on technology the gases everything is ruined the atmosphere <laughs> what <laughs> was so intelligible <laughs> Like, yeah, that's, that's the conclusion of the 35k word essay. Everything is ruining the atmosphere. <laughs> and then he asks his psychiatrist to continue therapy via mail. And the psychiatrist is like, that's, that's not how life works. That just, you, how can you be so intelligent? And yet yeah, so dumb. That always surprises me with people. Not about the intelligent, all the dead, yes, as well. It's like the street smarts versus book smarts. But also, especially with maturity. With some people, I'm like, how are you 28? Super mature about X, but like a complete child about Z. Like, how does that work in your head? Yes, I'm a boring person. Thank you for noticing. And in July that year, he hiked out into the woods and was just again isolating himself, relaxing in this hunting camp as far from humankind as he could possibly manage. And this is when he would hear sound of airplanes uh, for about an hour. And this followed by what he describes as a sonic boom. This single event enraged him and depressed him to the point that he was like, nope, let me return to the cabin, let me start off, like, this is unacceptable. You know, the planes, again, as I told you, ruining the atmosphere, all this technology, polluting the air for a whole hour. I don't know what he meant by a sonic boom, but pretty sure it's something along those lines too. And this next paragraph kind of, I think, defines Ted as a, as a human. And it's just one of the best things I have read <laughs> just online in general. He begins to shoot passing helicopters and low-flying planes. But he, he never succeeds. Big surprise. And another big surprise, it doesn't help with his mental health. Mm -hmm, I know, right? This is what he wrote about the incident because he was still upset about it, so he wrote in his journal. It is not a noise in itself that bothers me, but what the noise signifies. It is the voice of the octopus, the octopus that will allow nothing to exist outside the range of its control. The outdoors have been tainted for him, he said. I still love it. I suppose it is the same way a mother loves a child who has been crippled and mutilated. It is a love filled with grief. I feel like this is... This is what parents feel if they listen to my podcast and listen to the parenting advice that I give. But yet, I don't say shit like this because no, I cannot relate to that, that particular part. Mm -hmm. I can relate to you being annoying, posting pictures of your kid on social media because I know what th that shit is going to bring to your child. But no, that you cannot relate to this soz. Also, I cannot stop but think about, and I didn't say because I didn't want to ruin my sudden poetic spur of how I'm telling you the story in the beginning. But remember that expression, eating the cake and having it too? It's like, that is the, the most chill line of all times, is the one you chose for your 35,000 word ma serious manifesto that is supposedly gonna change the world and convert people's opinions. But this is the kind of thing that you leave for your journal. Like, uh, where's the balance? Where is the logic? Fully inspired by this, on November the 15th, 1979, he attempts to bomb an airline. Oh yeah, he escalates pretty quickly. The bomb was placed in the cargo of a plane in Chicago, Illinois. But of course, because he is again luckily not an expert at this point, due to the faulty timing system, the bomb just starting smoking and just causing the pilot to make the emergency landing. Twelve of the passengers were treated for smoke inhalation, and they have actually said the bomb was active, like it would still be able to blow up the whole airplane. It is one thing that I cannot fully chemically explain, but I'll try a bit later because it kind of spoils it. Okay, but it's one thing that he does that kind of is the reason why these initial bombs wouldn't actually blow up the way that he thought that they would. So by this point in 1979, FBI is on his case and they give him a name. And this is when he gets the name Unabomber. It stands for University and Airline Bomber. 
His fourth bomb is sent on June the 10th, 1980, and it's sent to United Airlines president, because this guy holds a grudge like no other bitch. What always fascinated me is people who, like, had a crush. And maybe that person doesn't even know that you have a crush on them. But no, you hold a grudge against everything that they do, everything that they say. Everything is, like, so personal. This is Ted with airlines. He's like, no, I will have my revenge. And they're like, but we haven't done anything personal. To it doesn't matter. This bomb was disguised as a book. And it was sent to the United Airlines president, Percy Wood, in Chicago again. And this one was pretty effective in a way that it did damage his tie, his face, his hands. And it was pretty cunning, because he kind of sent it as a book in such a way to, like, identify with this person. Like, everybody in the power should read this, you know, open it right now. This is also when he develops his signature and starts signing these packagings off with FC, which stands for Freedom Club his fifth bomb was a bust as well, so it was sent in October 1981 to the University of Utah. But this one was diffused before detonation. So you're picking up on a pattern now, universities. What you might not have picked up on yet is that he's sending it to professors. But in such a way, I think I've read somewhere that like the return address is usually addressed to like a student. So you remember like with that, you know, a couple of bombs ago, there's so many of them, that it landed with a graduate. That's why, because his cunning ass sent it to professors and then return address, if they were just like, oh, this is like a random package, return it, would go to a student. I mean, I feel like with every case, I am like 10 times more paranoid in what I do in real life. But with this one, with every single package I have received this week, I love how I'm saying it, like, I receive packages every day, it's like, the one package. I have checked the label, I was like, is this from Amazon? Is my name printed? Uh, what is the return address? Let me scan this barcode, let me just confirm. Sigh. The sixth bomb was sent on May the 5th, 1982, to Vanderbilt University in Nashville. So here the secretary, Janet Smith, received severe injuries to both her hands and required extensive treatment, so he's getting better and better at this. And you kind of got to wonder, did he do certain things on purpose? Like, did he just want to torture people to know that they are going to be disfigured? Or was he actually bad at making bombs to begin with and it was just impulsive, but he actually wanted to blow up people? The seventh bomb was sent on July the 2nd and was received by University of California. This is where he used to work. Here again, the victim, Diagenes Angelakos, received his injuries to the right hand, but he recovered. Also, I'm always, I realize I'm saying that it was sent on the day, but it was actually received on the day because he lived in the middle of nowhere. He most probably just sent it at random, which again tells you something, because usually when people do certain things, they do it on like a specific date, which is important to them. And Ted Kaczynski just did not have a specific date. He did not care. Also, I don't know why it took this long, but this is when, from my sources, they have stated that this is when the hotline was established, and also this is when the FBI profiled him and has set up a reward. The FBI thought they were looking for a blue-collar mechanic or somebody good with their hands. They also thought he might be a disgruntled former airline employee looking to revenge himself like at the big shots. But they didn't realize that there was one clue by John Douglas, the man that I told you, you know, read everything by John Douglas, but especially the Mindhunter, yes, has given them as this first clue a couple of years earlier, actually, like in the initial report. And that is that he is probably from Chicago and has connections to academia, and that's why he is attacking all of these professors. So Douglas also suggested that this terrorist would be a white male in his late 20s or early 30s and would be an asocial, obsessive, compulsive loner of above-average intelligence, just on the nose with everything that they're saying. They will also, with the upcoming bombs, kind of refine this profile to describe Ted as a neo-ludite holding an academic degree in hard sciences. And yes, if you're wondering what a neoludism is, it's like this philosophy that opposes modern technology. So, you know, yes, cool, correct. But then they kind of discarded it and they were like, oh no, he's actually a blue-collar airplane mechanic. And like, 
maybe maybe you should have stuck to the academia thing because who the fuck else is just making bombs and aiming at professors that's the thing i think ted did well as far as i hate his saying it to confuse them once he started aiming at airlines because they were like well clearly he is up to like causing the most damage possible whereas ted was actually you know doing that loner to loner violence like every fucking bully out there ever and they set up the 1 million reward. The aid bomb was sent in May 1985 to the University of California. Again, this is when Ted still wanted it to go to a professor, but instead a graduate student, John Hauser, received the bomb and with it he received partial loss of vision in one of his eyes and lost four of his fingers. So he's getting more and more fucked up. And his bombs are getting much more powerful. I put he stop being stingy on his bombs which again you must ask yourself who was supporting this guy and how is he obtaining all of these materials especially the chemicals ninth bomb was received on june 13 1985 in auburn washington but was also diffused and this is when they kind of notice the actual mistake and that is that there is not enough oxygen in the air tech for it to blow up like remember that airplane bomb where it was kind of like fizzling out in the air basically you put too many things in it and left these things without oxygen you know kind of like a bag of crisps right it actually needs to have that oxygen even though we hate it and we all wonder why it's filled up only 20 percent of that little packet yeah G great analogy i'm winning today with these analogies totally not avoiding that there's so many more bombs to go through. Bomb number 10 was received on November the 15th, 1985, and it was sent to Ann Arbor. However, again, people that have received it were not Ann Arbor. They were James McConnell and Nicholas Suino. Suino actually received shrapnel wounds and McConnell permanently lost his hearing. And he took 10 bombs but we have just reached the first fatality. Why did I sound so like, oh my god, finally? And why I think this was a success, and by success I mean for him, it clearly ended up in murder. That's because he started being random, but again in the most cunning way. There's just something so fucked up about Ted. He started putting these bombs randomly in parking lots. And people in the 1980s, again, did not, just did not know better than not to touch a thing that's just in the middle of a parking lot. Man, I only had one bomb scare write to me, email me, podbymygmail.com if you ever had bomb scares, because they're the weirdest thing, and it's just such a 21st century scare, especially on the tube. This one was on the tube because nobody was claiming freaking luggage. And you know that like uh, announcement was going on like hey somebody can somebody claim the luggage and it was obviously in my carriage on that part of the train i was just looking like there's only a couple of people it can only be one of these people and in my head i was strategically planning what station they were to blow up so like so that i can get off like next station because in my head like i immediately go i'm like hey maybe i should wait like a couple of stations you know oxford circus is a couple of stations so that's the one that they will blow up put the fuck get the hell out and then yeah, the guy just stood up like he was listening to something or wasn't listening to this or didn't understand it. I don't know what the hell it was. I was like, oh yeah, that's mine. Everybody looked at him like, God, I think I still got off at the next station because yeah, I just don't risk my life like that. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if you didn't understand or if you just don't care and you plan to kill us all. So I'm going to be safe. Cool, Ted Kaczynski, first fatality. So this happened on December 11th, 1985 in Sacramento. When the appliance store owner, Hugh Scrutton, went to remove the board from his parking lot, it just exploded. And shrapnel, because I googled it, looked like these little bullets. It kind of looks like from the war era kind of thing, with loads of different little different metal pieces inside. So I suppose if that blows up, it's those little metal pieces that do the most damage. So these shrapnels tore through Hugh's organs and impaired his heart, and that's how he died. And here people, like the police, actually really started to notice that he is escalating and also using better, more effective materials. So obviously not great for the police. The 12th bombing was on February the 20th, 1987. 
This was sent to Salt Lake City, Utah. And this gave computer store owner Gary Wright severe damage to his left arm and caused him to have reconstructive surgery. And it's only this time that this sketch came into the play. It's that infamous sketch. And there's a couple of questions that people have about that sketch, which is, uh, hey, why the hell is it so wrong? But also B, uh, why is it so red? Like, why do I want it, you know, on the wall of my room? Why does it look like a cover of some of the coolest solo singer ever? You're like, yeah, I want to listen to whatever he's saying. The answer to both of those questions is that the only witness to him was this secretary working at this Cam's Inc. shop. And the only figure she saw from afar was this guy with a hood and aviator sunglasses putting something down all the way across the parking lot. So she used to work for Gary. 13th bomb was received on June the 22nd, 1993 and was sent to Tiburon, California, and it caused destruction of both ears and damage to three fingers for this guy, Charles Epstein. Now, yes, I did say 1993, and the 12th one was in 87, so how the hell was he just chilling for six years? Well, he might not have been chilling after all, because the 14th bomb did probably the most damage and it was the most targeted, I would say. It was kind of like everything he aspired to accomplish. So on June 24th, 1993, he attacked, well, maybe his nerdiest victim. The bomb was mailed to Yale University in Connecticut, where it injured this professor called David Gallatner. And he lost the vision in one of his eyes, and he lost part of his right hand. This guy, oh my, this sounds like such a nightmare, I hate this one. Because he dragged himself five flights of stairs. And after all of this, he said he didn't even like computers that much. Just imagine, you're like, oh, actually, I hated this job. This is why it's important to find the jobs that you actually like. Imagine fucking losing part of yourself on a job that you hate. It's like, is there a worst thing out there? Also here, Unabomber got off particularly because even after attacking him, he actually called his brother, so the professor's brother, and told him that he is next. This is uh, here, I mean, all the way up until now, but now in particular, I'm like, okay, this like geek on geek violence is reminding me of that passive aggressive behavior that nerds had in class. We always had, let's just talk about for a second about that one person that was like, teacher, teacher, but we had homework and you're looking at them like, what the fuck is your problem? I vividly remember it. This teacher was like, well, I could let you go early. You know, I finished teaching today. This bitch legit lifted her arm and was like, no, but we had homework. Why don't we go across that? Did somebody ask you to plan a lesson? And honestly, it is about how these professors react to that. I'm telling you, if your professor to that is like, yeah, no, 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 you rule my life. Let's just go all over your homework. Mm -hmm. That professor is a fucking psychopath. You don't just like, kids, do your life. Also, you should know that everybody else hates this child now and you should fucking teach them a lesson. And then this wouldn't be a repetitive cycle that would happen with every fucking class because I know all of you have had this person. Cool. Now that I've lost it (laughs) over that, there just hasn't been an episode for me to express my anger over these people. And this was the only geek on geek violence one where I was like, okay, this reminds me of this passive aggressive thing. This was Ted Kaczynski in school. Like, uh, nobody will convince me. Like, please, if you have gone to school with Ted Kaczynski, just call me to confirm, yeah? Call me, yeah? Mm, Yeah, you're giving your number now, freak. Now the question that you are all probably thinking about is why was he choosing professors and how? How the hell did he have access to all of these unis and these professors? Well, (laughs) well, he would go into different public libraries and they had directories that were public to the people of all of the professors. So, you know, back in the day, it wasn't public on the internet. But, like, this is what I'm thinking about here as well. Right now, everything is on the internet. Like, something like this would be way too easy. I understand people have, like, you know, studied, they have PhDs, of course they're gonna be on the internet, of course they have published work. Everybody's, like, on LinkedIn now and shit. It shouldn't be as accessible, like, where these professors are kind of thing. My uni, people would know this is like the law department, this is where she studies criminology, so again, your chances of nailing literally the office where this professor lives are just huge. 
Okay, now on to his second fatality. This attack happened on December the 10th, 1994. The bomb was sent to North Caldwell, this was in New Jersey, and it killed the advertising executive Thomas J. Messer. Again, what I'm seeing here when looking at it, so this is December 94, the last one is June 93. How is he staying calm for all this time? Like, is he just brewing? Does he just know that he is now producing powerful bombs, like more powerful than usual? Because he's technically isolated from his family. He is in that cabin in the woods without a soul talking to him. I covered for the last meal of Timothy McQuay who at least had, say at least, god that case is fucked up, but I mean, he was, yes, isolating himself, like in cabin in the middle of nowhere, but he was with two other accomplices. I'm not saying it's easier to understand, because Timothy McVeigh was even, like, worse of a human, but it's kind of more easy to, I don't know, explain how this isolating person is just, what, living day to day, like, w what are his days? So like, give me a day in a life, Ted. Like, you, you woke up, what did you do? Did you start with freaking chemicals straight up? This guy. This is what happens when you don't have enough sex in your life. This is what I called with Randy Kraft. It's everything with these serial killers. It's like somebody should have caught on straight up. Be like, okay, this is not the right progression. Remember with Randy when he went all radicalized and went like, yeah, politics is life. Somebody should have caught on and be like, okay, no, son, are you wanky? Are you releasing those spermies? <laughs> releasing these spermies? What am I, 80? With Ted, you should have been like, you're a genius. Let's test you out before you isolate yourself in the cabin in the middle of nowhere. Because uh, this ain't something normal people do for this amount of years. And then let's reassess your decision. Every couple of years, you know, even presidency is reassessed. Not as often as it should be, to be honest, because if you suck at your job, you shouldn't be in the office for four years. That's the same thing, Ted. If you suck at what you're doing, you shouldn't be by yourself in the cabin in the woods for years. Reassess, regroup your decisions. Okay, third fatality. Jesus. Happened on April 24th, 1995. And this was a timber industry lobbyist, Gilbert P. Murray. So this happened in Sacramento. And this was again Ted versus now not a professor but like a nature hater, you know, timber lobbyist is like uh, he's going against environmental issues. So this guy again was the target for him. And the person bringing the bomb, like well, bringing the package into the building even said like, oh, this is heavy, it must be a bomb. <sighs> sigh, sigh, this is some like joke, that this is my luck in life, this is the kind of joke I would make and then it would result to fucking kill somebody. This was also right after Timothy McVeigh's Oklahoma bombing. Again, was this his ultimate mission? Was it like the ultimate target kind of thing where he was like targeting professors isn't really aligned with my mission? Or was he like jealous of Timothy McVeigh and what he has done and he was like, well, let me actually unleash it. And unlike McVeigh, I'm actually gonna target correctly and I'm not gonna have like a daycare that I kill in the process or just blow up a bunch of people that don't have anything to do with what I stand for. None of them is right, okay? None of this is correct. Well, luckily for everybody, this will be the last bomb. Now going back onto the story, where we left it off. Ted Kaczynski is gonna publish his manifesto in September 1995. And we are going back to David reading that manifesto. So David is, you know, finally listening to his wife and they're kind of going over all of these letters and documents written by his brother. Again, not encouraging everybody, but this was super dumb, okay? That Kaczynski, how can you be so genius and so dumb in certain cases? How would, did you leave all of the freaking transcripts? Like, you planned for this manifesto, probably. Or when you realize you're going to write the manifesto, you know, you should have gone to the family being like, Hey fam, haven't seen you in a long time. Just gonna go to this trunk and take all of my writings so that nobody can figure this out. No, because you're too obsessed with your own mission, idiot. So David is reading these letters and documents and then he decides to call a tip line. Remember, they established the reward, they established the tip line. So again, you're going into the shoes of David, right? You're like, hey, hi, police, my name is David. I know this is gonna sound like super silly, but I think my own bro, you know, yeah, like my own brother who I aspire to my whole life is uh, this serial killer that you're looking for. I know, awkward moment, but listen, where can I drop these letters, these documents written by the brother? Yeah, would you have like anybody analyzing these linguistics things? And they're like, this is 
the most promising lead we've had so far. Also, the guy just accused his brother, like, what the fuck is his problem? So they're like, yeah, bring it for linguistic analysis. And sure enough, they determine that it's the same person. But also, obviously, for the search warrant, they had to combine, like, where was Ted at what times, like, facts of his life, and did they coincide with the bombings? And of course, they did. So now they're talking to David, they're like, okay, listen, you seem to know your brother quite a lot, like, probably better than us. How do we approach this cabin in the middle of nowhere? And David was like, well, you know, from all of these attacks, the way you approach it is... You strike up a convo about something he's passionate about. So they're like, say no more. Please, the FBI, everybody is in this place in Western Montana where the cabin is. For weeks. If this goes wrong, he most definitely has bombs in there. He's gonna blow this whole village up. So they're kind of scouting, you know. It's like new faces in town. Again, it just tells you about the focus of Ted Kaczynski because if he hadn't had this focus, he would have most certainly noticed there's like other people in town that suspiciously look like cops. But luckily he didn't. So on April the 3rd, 1996, he's just sitting in his cabin. And he hears an outside voice just calling him out and they say they're the forest service and they want to talk to him about the border of his property line. Of course, he was like, yeah, this is pissing me off. What you want? Like, you know, this is my property. Like, I'm not doing any damage to anybody. And he walks outside, walks a couple of steps from his cabin. And this is where the FBI agents immediately like hands in the air and they finally arrest him. Of course, they were a lot more fortunate and this was actually the smartest decision because attached to Kaczynski's bed, there was another bomb designed to set this cabin on fire, basically a suicide mission if he was ever to have gotten caught and to destroy obviously all of his journals, all of the evidence. I say suicide mission, but I don't think it was in a sense like he wanted to destroy the evidence but not to kill himself. Like his plan was if he was ever cornered, like, yeah, he would notice it, and then he would go through the forest, like, recover the food and ammunition, everything that he buried in, like, different hiding places, and he's gonna move to Canada. That's at least from, like, what people who interviewed him said later. And it's good that they caught him, because he had a bomb ready to mail underneath of his bed. And you really need to see the picture of Ted Kaczynski, like, before and after. His uni picture, actually, he is quite okay looking. Like, even for me, I'm like, whoa, when I see his, like, uni picture or whatever, like, high school picture, like, his graduation pic, he looks quite decent. Like, you can see he's kind of, like, from Polish background. You can see that's, like, the type that people fall for in Eastern Europe. And then you see Ted Kaczynski coming out of the cabin and you're just like feeling for all of the people around him because you know, you can see from the picture how bad that body odor is. It's just like, yep, this guy did not shower in fucking five years. And of course, once they actually stepped and co- sort of like disabled all of these bombs and all this ammunition, they find all of the devices, they find the bombs, they find all of the evidence, the directory of the professors. They find a draft of his manifesto. The manifesto, I'm not sure if I mentioned, this is already like an hour long episode. But the manifesto is available online, if you want to look at it. I would not suggest it, wasting a split second on it. So there's 232 points in total, and by points I mean they're paragraphs, and then he has footnotes. But this is his ending, this is the point you free to, just to give you a sense, also such a non-powerful ending, it just can keep droning on forever and ever. The last two lines are, but we are not in the position to assert confidently that no such movements have existed prior to modern leftism. This is a significant question to which historians ought to give their attention. That's it. How do you think that's a powerful ending, Ted? But as I mentioned earlier, it's really the point 185 that actually made David finally realize that this was his brother. And it is super short and super snappy. As for the negative consequences of eliminating industrial society, well, you can't eat your cake and have it too. To gain one thing, you have to sacrifice another. And I love that this is exactly what happens here. This whole story is just about how people focus on like the wrong things and then neglect everything else because every single other paragraph is the longest thing, whereas this thing is like two lines. So maybe you as David didn't even have to read through all of this other nonsense. You were just like, hey, what's the shortest line here? And then like he mentions these dumbass expressions that he used as a kid. They're like, we got him. 
Of course, now Ted goes to trial. And well, if you thought like he was going to be a delightful person to work with, of course not. Ted thought that he was the smartest person in the room. So his lawyers were like, listen, the only way you kind of can avoid a death penalty is if you plead the sanity defense. And it will be super easy to do, like, look at you, dude. You have lived in the cabin for how many years? You have published this manifesto? Like, it's super easy. It's actually a great day as a lawyer. But of course, that is like, nope, no way. He wanted to preserve his name. If he was to be labeled crazy, of course, the society is gonna ignore his manifesto, ignore all his ideas, and he did not want that for sure. However, he was denied to fire his lawyers, and just in general, denied anything in court. He got eight life terms in the maximum security prison in Colorado. Of course, he was friends with Timothy McRae that I mentioned. Listen to that case on, on Last Meals on YouTube if you want to. It's really interesting, it's depressing. You need to be in a, in a decent mood to like actually not lose it when listening to that case, but it kind of is, explains mostly the psychology and kind of explains that only these two people could have been friends, truly. And of course, he has fans. Do you not do you not smell the body odor from the through the pictures? I don't get it. Also, nobody will ever convince me that these admirers, all of these bitches losing it, have actually read his manifesto or know anything about it. It's probably the dullest, like just not an intellectual relationship, but he still thrives on it because he never got bitches in real life. And again, there is something about this, but um, I think we spoke about Son of Sam Law in one of the episodes where they can't make profit out of their works from prison, but they can still technically publish their works. So he published two books. In 2010, he published Technological Slavery, and he actually worked with a professor to publish this book. Like, this was kind of a partnership of sorts. His cabin has been seized and is displayed now in a museum in Washington, D.C., I like that play of words when it comes to museum. And this piece of shit wanted to actually donate some of his books and some of his works to Northwestern University, where he actually conducted two attacks. However, they refused it. And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah. But then I read the rest of the sentence and they refused it because they already have the copies of it. Why are we doing this? Why are we allowing this to happen? Why are we not having better idols? The world's current range of idols goes from, like, American Idol to, like, something like Ted Kaczynski. It's... it's embarrassing. Okay, well, we can't wrap this up without going into the background of Ted's and trying to figure out how did this even reach the point where he went to the cabin and started planning his bombs. Ted was born in Chicago in 1942 to a couple of Polish Americans. His dad was a sausage maker. I just found that. <laughs> I don't know what I found that, but I just found that to be somehow even more depressing because it's just what Ted strived for and like the, the family that he came from that literally tried to just make a nice, honest living. It's just bizarre. So. Ted was said to have been a happy baby until he got hives and he was forced into a hospital isolation. So this is kind of like early in his age when this isolation started. And after this, he was said to have showed little emotion to people for months. David actually later remembered this event where like I think they got him like a pet rabbit. And this rabbit was kind of in a cage and the whole family was like, you know, surrounding you, playing with it. And Ted just sort of came like all frustrated from the back of them and kind of let this rabbit out of the cage and was kind of caressing it. and made everybody just feel like, wow, we were actually just caging this animal and like behaving as if it was in a circus. Whereas Ted here actually loved animals and just didn't want any animal to feel isolated because of this hospital isolation that he went through. They soon realized in school that he had the IQ of 167, so he was just above Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein. So yeah, that ain't gonna go well. <laughs> After he graduated from the Evergreen Park Community School, he skipped the 11th grade because he was just too fucking smart for it. He got accepted to Harvard and got full scholarship at the age of just 16. Again, why are these things allowed? I am sorry, but again, going back to that thing where it's like, no, there is a reason why there are certain, like, age limits. Kid is not supposed to be 16 and at Harvard. It's just not. 
also why do we allow 16 year olds to drive in the US like what the fuck how can a 16 year old have a driver's license but they apparently can't drink until 21 like your brains are not forming in the way that these age limits exist okay cool somebody fix the goddamn laws moving on of course he was a loner throughout this whole period but Ted if you are familiar with this case had a particular thing that marked him for life well I would say this would mark anybody for life But during Harvard, he participated in this study, in an experiment. Let's call it a study, because that's what this psychologist, Henry Murray, who conducted it, called it. This is pretty much like Stanford experiment kind of level. In this study, it kind of seems like all innocent on the surface, but you just know it's not, because people were supposed to write an essay on their personal philosophies, then they would hook them up to these electrodes to measure their physiological response, And then they would debate with them for hours. And by debate, I mean they would subject these people to insults, personal attacks, based on these ideologies, based on just anything. So they were instructed to berate them, to mock them, to belittle everything they held dear. And obviously these philosophies were like their personal values. They were just hooked up to electrodes and had to take it, like, in the bright light. Ugh, I hate those things in the hospital light and just take it. As Ted later explained, he wanted to prove he can take it and that he can't be broken. And the scope of this was more than 200 hours. So more than 200 hours of people just berating you, taking you apart. So his probably emotional well-being wasn't the best after as a result. However, he still graduated from Harvard with a bachelor's degree in mathematics in 1962. He'd later get a master's and a doctorate as well in the same subject from the University of Michigan. So after he completed everything, by the age of 25, he had a freaking PhD. He started working as the youngest assistant professor at University of California of Berkeley, where he taught calculus in 1967. He ended up resigning from this job. Also, he was told to be boring. Just You just know like that this is the type of professor that will just drone on and try to instill their own versions of events, even though it's calculus, for hours on end. Like, no witty jokes, nothing to break the silence, nothing. <laughs> okay, but this next thing is the best part of his life, also the weirdest. I even put what the fuck is the following paragraph even. Okay, so this is gonna be copy-paste because it's pure, it's pure gold. So for a period of several weeks in 66, Kaczynski experimented intense sexual fantasies of being a female. And he decided to undergo a gender transition. Now you're like, okay, cool, so uh, th- we're not gonna talk about this ever again? Like, this is not gonna pop up in psychological analysis of his, like, ever again? He even went to the point where he arranged to meet with a psychiatrist, but he changed his mind in the waiting room. He himself described this episode as a major turning point in his life but in a way where he felt disgusting about his sexual cravings, he felt humiliated and he hated the psychiatrist who he hasn't even seen. Now the next line, (laughs) the next line. Like a phoenix, I burst from the ashes of my (laughs) of my despair to a glorious new hope. (laughs) Okay, Harry Potter and the Phoenix Awakening. And then we never speak about it. No, this never pops up. Like, maybe he actually wanted to be a female this whole time. Imagine that plot twist. After he left the uni and he left his job, he returned to Illinois to live with his parents for two years before he moved to this cabin that he built outside Lincoln in Montana in 71. Of course, he was broke, so he hoped to live self-sufficiently by teaching himself survival skills, like hunting, organic farming, He also took like odd jobs in the area and just got like some financial support, some money from his family. And he truly couldn't have functioned in the normal society, like even during this time there was some like industrial development in the area. And this guy was again so influenced by other people's writings against it that he started vandalizing construction sites to just sabotage the development of these new buildings. And it was this when he was like making hikes around Montana, so like around his cabin, trying to sabotage this, that he said, it was from this point on, I decided that rather than trying to acquire further wilderness skills, I would work on getting back to the system. Revenge. 
So for me, personally, that's kind of like the point of no return. Everything before that, yes, was radical. He was like emotionally broken, never had like a normal freaking relationship, all of that. But then it's kind of like he felt his own property or like the surroundings around his property have been attacked. And well, yeah, we know when we feel it on our skin, personally, that's it, we're done. So what motivated Ted Kaczynski? With Ted, obviously, we have his longest fucking piece of work, so we have his writing, so we know what he thought motivated him, right? And he said he was motivated to kill by a lifelong rage and hatred of society, not because he was a nature lover or he hated technology so much. From his own writings, he said, I emphasize that my motivation is a personal revenge. I don't pretend any kind of philosophical or moralistic justification. My ambition is to kill a scientist, big businessman, government official, of the like. I would also like to kill a communist. I love how I read that as if he just said, like, I would also like a piece of cake. Like, the way it's just his writings just don't make sense. You don't, like, wrap it around and summarize it and just go back to the main point. No. Also, how is your last sentence? It's like, well, historians should look into it. Like, uh, goodbye. The, the fuck? <laughs> Why did I read any of it? These are kind of like bits and pieces from it that I found on the internet when looking motives. I didn't read further into this shit. But yeah, he said he has no illusion of creating this new ideal society. Well, according to him, ideal. But rather, his goals, his motives are to destroy the existing form of it. However, obviously, there's like the noble nature of it, which is to protect the wild nature. And then he went through that point 185, where he was like, well, eliminating industrial society, yes, they, it might be some negative consequences, but you can't eat your cake and have it too. I said it, I said the word cake in this freaking essay. You know what he reminds me of again? You remember when you, I mean, if you're fucking mentally 12 like me forever, and you would write up like the first drafts of the essay and you would just put random words like penis, vagina into it, and then just hope to remember to delete it. Uh, like out of your other draft. Yeah, that was that Kaczynski gave it like cake. You know, cake today can be slang for other things, so maybe Ted Kosinski was actually trying to tell us something more about his sexuality. Yeah, that is my conclusion about this. <laughs> I personally put radicalization as the motive, because as I mentioned, like, I've covered Tim Tim Quay and kind of can spot, like, certain patterns when it comes to just bombers in general. So radicalization is when an individual or a group kind of adopts this extreme political, social, or religious views in most cases it can lead to violence. And as we know, Ted Kaczynski spent a great chunk of this document discussing left-wing politics, leftism, how it's driven by feelings of inferiority, by over-socialization, and how the movement that opposes technology and excels nature must take this anti-leftist stance and must avoid collaboration with all of the leftists. And now you might be thinking, but what about, like, remember his insanity defense? Like, this doesn't sound like a sane person. Maybe you're thinking, like, hey, I'm actually radicalized in certain views, but I'm not out there planning and plotting bombs and reading a library directory of professors. People who actually kind of looked at Kaczynski, looked at his brain, looked at his crimes, said that he exhibited a predisposition to schizophrenia. So this was his expert for defense, Karen Brock Framing. So everybody that studied him said like he suffered from paranoid type schizophrenia and this was largely based on the conviction that he harbored these delusional beliefs about the threats posed by technology. But then as we know, that didn't allow people to actually speak to him, well, psychologists to actually speak to him and to diagnose him, so they further said that they found evidence of Kaczynski's insanity in his refusal to accept their diagnosis or to help them reach those diagnoses. Nobody wins, just, just say, maybe like, nobody wins in this story. Now we have the whole story, so what is left to say? Well, we need to finish where we started, and for that I need to put you in David's shoes again. Because what happened to David after his brother went to prison? Did he ever feel remorse about it? Did he ever question reporting his brother? 
as a brother of the serial killer, what do you feel now? Obviously, Ted doesn't want to have anything to do with you. He doesn't want to have anything to do with David because technically he considers him to be a snitch and to have stopped him, to, I don't know, the achieving his primal mission in life. But then you kind of think about where it all began for you and for him. And you remember that you aspired to your brother to that degree that when he suggested isolating themselves in this cabin in Montana, you went for it. You built a second cabin even, just a thousand miles apart from your brother. It was you and him against the world. It was two Spartan men living without running water, without electricity. For eight years in the cabins that you built for yourselves, you built these cabins by hand. And then you kind of remember what broke the two of you apart. It was the summer of 1969, and you and your brother were traveling Canada. You were searching for another plot of land for Ted. And this is when, lying on the grass, just staring in the night sky, you yourself said, I wish we could go home, because you realized this is not the life you want to be living. However, you also realized that Ted was fully committed to it. And this is when also the memories keep flooding of the years after that, because you ended up being sacked by the hand of your own brother from this factory that he was working at and you kind of remember he was like really nasty to other people he was particularly harassing this fellow woman worker posting these crude offensive messages about her on this factory wall and you remember receiving calls that like whenever you would visit your family they would say that they have gotten some accusatory letters from ted just accusing them that they never loved him and just him isolating himself even more. And it's that when you realized that you don't know this version of your brother any longer. So you gotta think that he wasn't actually sending the bombs while you were still working with him, while you still lived a thousand miles apart and would still visit your brother, but were all of these things just mounting up to a trigger? Because you remember that in May 1978, he posted his first mail bomb. And during this time, obviously, you meet your wife, Linda, and you decide to move from this resort in Texas and go to live in New York. And instead of you thinking like your brother is going to be super thrilled about it, super happy about it, he actually writes you a 20-page letter where he accuses you of lacking the integrity to lead a pure life. So yes, you feel bad, but your own brother just ended a letter saying that he doesn't want anything to do with you from now on. He even went to that degree to say that you have to put a line under the stamp on the envelope in the case of emergency. Otherwise, he's just gonna burn the letter and never open it and never read it. And if you were to be that person, the cheeky person to put the line under the stamp on any other occasion, he's just never gonna read any of them. Then your memory goes back to you actually using that dumb line under the stamp when you had to communicate to your recluse brother your father was dying from lung cancer. And you thought, hey, maybe this might be the time for me to reunite to my brother. Maybe he's just gonna leave his cabin in the woods and continue with his normal life. But no, you receive a letter back thanking you for using the line appropriately and having no mention of your dad. In the end, whenever you think about Ted, you think about your mom's words, never abandon Ted, ringing in your ears. But you know you decided you don't know the brother you grew up with any longer. You know that this is not the brother that once released the rabbit out of the box because he considered it too cruel. Because in the end, it all goes back to the memory of you asking your mother what's wrong with Teddy when you were seven years old. And your mom's response will haunt you for the rest of your life. Never abandon Ted, because that's what he fears the most. That's it for this week's episode. Don't forget to support this podcast by subscribing on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to it. You can also get merch on Redbubble and Teesprings. The links are below. Let me know if you hated this structure or if this is something you might want me to implement in the future. But until then, happy Monday and keep making the world a better place. One more team at a time. Bye, fuckers!